Hello class, Mr. Fino here. This is Unit 5, Lesson 3 on learning about world religions, Buddhism. So in this lesson, you're going to learn about the main beliefs and teachings of Buddhism. Uh, this image here shows the Eightfold Path. I'm going to go into more detail on it later, but it is one of the most important aspects of uh, Buddhism and Buddhist teachings. All right, so first, uh, I'm just going to ask the question, who can practice Buddhism? And what's really cool about Buddhism is that it embraces all people, regardless of their social class. And this is important in India because with, um, with Hinduism, all right, um, the caste system kind of became an important kind of ingrained thing within it. Now, people would argue that, you know, there was no place for the caste system in Hinduism, but... The fact is, um, you know, you had this very um, rigid, broken up society with Brahmins at the top and Dalits, untouchables and shooters on the bottom. And so that left a lot of people in Hinduism looking for something more, looking for a belief system that would give them hope. And Buddhism does that in a lot of ways. Um, and here on the right, we see a map showing the percent of Buddha. Uh, the percent of the population that is Buddhist. So, um, you know, there's a few countries that have high percentages of, of, of uh, Buddhists, but for the most part, you know, it is the fourth most popular religion in the world, but, um, you know, in most countries, you know, other religions are probably more practiced, but nonetheless, Buddhism is a very popular uh, religion. All right, so we're going to start with the... The main figure of Buddhism, uh, Prince Siddhartha. Uh, we're going to start by looking at his birth. So, uh, Prince Siddhartha was born about 563 BCE in Nepal. So that's about, let's see, 25, 2,585 years ago. All right, in Nepal, and Nepal is just north of India. Um, Nepal is the location of the Himalayas, so it's a, a mountainous uh, region, a mountainous country. And um, for, for some time frame, right, 563 BCE, before the Common Era, that's, you know, 563 years before the birth of, of Jesus. So, again, this is a very old religion. Not as old as Hinduism, but still very old. So, Prince Siddhartha, uh, his parents were where they were king and queen of, of their region. They were powerful rulers. And um, uh, according to Buddhist traditions, before he was born, before Siddhartha was born, his mother, Queen Maya, had a strange dream. And this strange dream is very sounds very odd. In the dream, she was carried over the Himalayas uh, to a silver mountain uh, set and set on a silver couch, and then a white elephant with six tusks walk around her and struck her in the right side. So it was just an odd dream. You see a picture here of, of the dream. Um, but from that dream, Queen Maya and her and the king, they went to some Brahmins, right, priests, to help interpret what the dream meant. And um, they were told by the Brahmins that she was carrying a child who would be a great man. All right, and that would be Siddhartha. All right, so continuing on, so um, they said uh, the Brahmins told told her that um, Siddhartha, her son, would follow one of two paths. He could either rule the universe, right, as a ruler, as a king, right, this this um, worldly, political sort of reign, right, or to his second path. He would leave his royal life to end suffering as a religious figure. He would be this really important, enlightened figure. And so, um, yeah, those are the two two paths, potential paths. Um, and some more legends say, you know, this is just legend, that the Buddha was already a few years old when he was born. And when he was born, he said, I'm the leader of the world and the guide to the world. Um, here's an image of... Um, 
his birth, I guess. I think it's uh, the king is holding him here, right? And then uh, his mom is supposed to be next to him. All right, so next we'll go on to as he gets a little bit older. So the prince's royal life, right? He grew up in this royal family. Um, so Siddhartha's father, uh, who's named uh, Sudadana, he was worried that he would not become, he was worried that Siddhartha, Siddhartha would not become a great ruler, right? Because of that, that uh, prophecy. He was worried that he would become the, the priestly religious figure. So to prevent that from happening, he shielded his son from all suffering. Um, so he just lived this really fancy life. Siddhartha knew only the finest gardens, houses, education, and food. Um, so he just lived this really privileged life without suffering. Um, there were no cars or yachts, but you know that's kind of like what a modern day situation would be. Um, and even though he lived this lavish, fancy life, Siddhartha was curious about the world outside the palace walls. He wondered what's going on outside. Um, and so living this life, Prince Siddhartha was married um, at the age of 16 to a beautiful young noblewoman. Um, and for 13 years, the couples lived together in perfect harmony, enjoying the prince's many palaces, and they even had a son, um, had a child. Uh, and this was until the age of 29. So here we see all the fancy aspects of Siddhartha's life that he would have uh, enjoyed. Uh, but then at the age of 29, at 29 years old, um, his father gave him more freedom to, to travel around the, the, the royal palaces outside. And so Prince Siddhartha ventured outside the palace and discovered three forms of suffering in his wanderings, right? So um, he was being taken by a chariot driver and on his first trip, the prince and his chariot driver saw a thin man walking with the aid of sticks. And so he asked, why does that man look so terrible? And the driver replied that the man was old and that everyone's body weakens with age. So the first form of suffering he discovered was old age. On the second trip, the prince and his driver saw a man lying on the ground crying out in pain. And so uh, Siddhartha asked, what's wrong with that poor man? And the driver explained that the man was sick. So the second form of suffering that Siddhartha discovered was sickness. And on his third trip, the prince spotted a group of people walking slowly down the road and carrying a corpse, right, a dead body. And so Siddhartha's driver said, uh, death came for that man, and one day it will come for you too. So the, his, the final form of suffering was death. All right, so here is an image of that scene, right? There's the driver explaining to him what's going on. And you can see in the, in the background, you know, some of these forms of suffering. Um, and so Siddhartha was deeply troubled by his discovery and came upon an ascetic, right? An ascetic being a person who gives up worldly pleasures such as possessions, clothes, money, and shelter. And um, the ascetic was glowing with, with inner peace. You know, he had nothing, but he was just, you could, he could tell he was peaceful, he was happy. So when Siddhartha asked how the man could be so peaceful, you know, with nothing and with all the suffering around him, with all the death and the illness and the old age, the ascetic responded that to be free of suffering, one must give up the desires, pleasures, and comforts of the world. And he said, I find peace by helping others find peace. So this really resonated with Siddhartha. And so um, it inspired him to want to find the same peace and happiness as the ascetic. So Siddhartha left his family, his wife and his child, to search for enlightenment. So Siddhartha uh, went out uh, into the forest. His uh, driver took him out to the forest um, and he removed his royal robes, his sandals, his jewels, and he cut off his hair. He wore a simple robe and he carried a small bowl for alms. And remember, alms are gifts of food. So he would have just had this bowl and he would have asked for food from people that would be willing to give it. Um, and so Siddhartha with other ascetics, as you can see in this picture, became an expert at meditation, right? That focused 
you know, focusing the mind on ideas and on your breathing. And um, so this idea of being a, a, an ascetic, Siddhartha denied himself of basic needs. So he would have kept himself up all night without sleeping. He would have sat in the hot sun for long periods of time um, without shelter. Uh, he would have held his breath for several minutes at a time um, and fasted, which means to not eat for um, you know, days at a time. And he hoped to find spiritual truth through these forms of self-denial. Um, it is said that Siddhartha became so thin that when he touched his stomach, he could feel his backbones. Just a visual image there of how thin he would have become. But unfortunately, through all of this, Siddhartha, did not, he didn't find enlightenment. And he just found that he was really unhappy. And so he, he gave up being an ascetic. Um, so from this uh, work as an ascetic, he learned that denying bodily pleasures did not bring enlightenment, didn't bring enlightenment for him. So he aimed to find a balance between pleasure and pain right, a perfect balance known as the middle way, right? So just, you know, not too much, not too little. He wanted to find this balance. So one day, uh, Siddhartha sat under what would become known as the Bodhi tree um, or enlightenment tree. And he vowed to meditate until he attained enlightenment. He felt like his enlightenment was, was near so he said, I'm going to sit down here. I'm going to meditate until it happens. So legend says that while meditating, Siddhartha was tempted by the wicked god Mara, who tried to frighten him. Um, and Mara sent his three daughters, um, discontent, passion, and desire, to tempt Siddhartha. But with, in his meditation, he was able to resist them. He continued to meditate about the nature of reality and he was able to reach nirvana or true happiness and, and perfect peace. Um, that night, his mind was filled with the truths he sought. Um, he saw his past lives, the great cycle of rebirth and the importance of karma. And he saw how to gain freedom from the continuous cycle and therefore end all suffering. And in all of this, he became the Buddha, the enlightened one. All right, and here's an image of um, the three daughters of, of uh, Mara tempting him. All right, so um, the truths he discovered under the Bodhi tree in, in that meditation session where he attained enlightenment and saw, uh, and, you know, reached nirvana are, are now known as the Four Noble Truths. And so the first of the Four Noble tr Truths, number one, is that suffering is present in all things and nothing lasts forever. Right, so suffering, and you know, we suffer when we worry that we're going to lose good things in our life. Um, number two, suffering is caused by cravings, which are desires and wants. When we want things, we think, oh, I really want that. I really want a PS5. And you just think about it all the time. I want a PS5. And it makes you unhappy, right? Um, number three, the way to end suffering is to give up all cravings. So to stop suffering, you have to stop wanting things. You have to stop desiring things. And the way to give... The way to give up all cravings is to live life according to the eightfold path, which is here. Now, I want to go into more detail on this. And I really like how they laid this out. The eightfold path has the potential to be confusing, but this makes it very simple. So, um, again, the the way to get to, to, to make sure you're, you're giving up all those cravings, right? All those things that you want and you desire is to follow your life according to these eight things. So, the Buddha said that one could end suffering and find enlightenment by following these eight teachings. So number one is right understanding. And that is to develop a deep understanding of the Four Noble Truths. And when they say deep, they, they mean deep, not on a surface level, these four things. They mean to really, really understand these things, you know, on a spiritual level. Uh, number two, right purpose, which is to live a life of selflessness, right? Which is not selfishness. You're selfless. Uh, love and nonviolence. Nonviolence is huge in Buddhism. Uh, three is right speech, which is to be careful and truthful in what you say, 
Do not lie or gossip. Right? You don't want to use words to hurt anyone. Number four is right action. Do not, do not kill, steal, or lie. And to be honest with your actions. Uh, number five, right way to earn a living, which is do not work at a, at a job that causes harm to people or living creatures. And I think this one's also called right, um, what is it? Something else. It's not right. Well, regardless, that's, that's what that number five means. Do not work at a job that causes harm to people or living creatures. So that's an interesting one. Number six, right effort. Promote good actions and prevent evil actions. Right, you're making effort to do good, not evil. Number seven, right mindfulness is to be aware of, but not attached to your emotions, thoughts, and feelings. So you look, you can observe your thoughts, you can observe your emotions and your feelings, but you're not attached to them. You don't let them bring you down, essentially, or up, you know. And eight, right, act, right concentration, which is to focus your mind with such practices as meditation. All right, so th that's the Eightfold Path. All right, so the Buddhist teachings here. Um, the Four Noble Truths taught that all things could change. Uh, even when one finds pleasure, it does not last forever, which causes suffering. Uh, to end suffering, he taught people to follow the Eightfold Path or the Middle Way. And rather than selfishly esca escaping into enlightenment, I mean, he, he just he reached nirvana. He could have just said, I'm going to go live my life. I'm just going to go be perfectly happy, perfectly peaceful on my own. But he said, no, he wants to spend his life you know, teaching the, these ideas to other people so they could do the same thing. Um, and he spread his ideas throughout Asia. So in this lesson, you learned about the main beliefs and teachings of Buddhism. All right.